I'm PJ, and I've owned the X-Gym since 1998. Been in personal training since 1988, so, and since then I've been studying this stuff extensively. And not just personal training and exercise, but brain science and nutrition science. So I spend typically an hour to two hours every day since 88 studying this stuff. Started back when uh, I got my degree in exercise science was when the study and all that studying started. And uh, I've learned some pretty amazing things. And most of the things that I've learned contradict the traditional science in exercise and nutrition. And pretty much turn it upside down. So some of those things I'm talking about today, starting with the metabolism, because back when we were kids, that's me, when I was a kid, we could eat anything we wanted, and we just totally got away with it. And there's reasons for that. And back then, in 79, I ate pretty much anything I wanted, namely orange slices. That was my favorite thing. So. The uh, candy orange slices, so this is, this is sugar, you know these, you know what I'm talking about. It's sugar, it's made of sugar, and it's coated with sugar. So, and there's artificial flavors to make it taste like oranges. <laughs> so it's complete garbage, but that was my main staple. And then a few years later, in high school, put some muscle on, started working out, Doritos, a little better than orange slices, right? But not much. So you ask, well, how did I ever get away with that kind of food? Well, that's not all I ate, of course. I ate some good food too. Mom wasn't nutritionally abusive to me. She, um, she made good food too, but these were my main snacks. So kids of yesterday, the kids that 10, 15, especially 20 years ago, were pretty thin. And they're all running around. They're all doing stuff. And they ate real food. You know, even though I did eat the orange slices and the burritos, I also ate a lot of good real food. Food that actually had one ingredient, like lettuce or <laughs> orange. It didn't, instead of like the processed stuff and the packaged stuff in a bag or a box. And I was always playing, so outside, running around the street, playing kick the can, doing a lot of active stuff. Very little TV. So the kids of yesterday were limited to TV, and the parents did not use TV as a babysitter. They used it as an optional extra entertainment device. So there wasn't that much TV watching. We had PE in schools back then. The PE uh, got us playing, gave us ideas, because it was usually games and things like that. And we were active during school. And then NEAT. So that's non-exercise activity thermogenesis is what NEAT stands for. And NEAT is basically just moving around. So it's being on your feet. And kids of yesterday were on their feet, moving around. Then there's the kids of today. So they're not eating real food anymore. They're eating what we call food-like substances. So that's processed food. Doritos are a food-like substance. And those orange slices, are a, it's a food-like substance. It's not actually food. It's mostly chemicals and additives and preservatives. And if, when you look on the label, it's really hard to pronounce most of the words on the label. And in that ingredient list, it's a whole paragraph lot of ingredients. Kids today are playing video games like crazy and they're watching TV like crazy. They've taken PE out of most schools. And then the non-exercise activity thermogenesis is almost non-existent because they're doing all this other stuff just sitting around doing nothing. So the metabolism, when I say youthful metabolism, this talk would be hard to give 20 years from now because people are going to be looking back and they're going to say, well, I, I, I was, my metabolism sucked when I was a kid too. <laughs> but now, you know, we, we know it differently because we can remember back when things were different 
things really have changed that fast too. So thermogenesis is really the key to a youthful metabolism. And there's different kinds of thermogenesis. Thermogenesis just means heat inside your body kind of thing. So certain things cause that energy and that heat to happen inside your body. One is hormones. So when we're younger, we have a different set of hormones. We're growing. These hormones are new to our system. They're, they're amping us up. So it increases the need. And especially during our teenage years, you know, it's the, the male and female hormones that tend to burn more calories. And so that's part of it. That increases thermogenesis. And then we're just moving all the time. So as you can see, I was just moving all the time. I was on, it's hard to get a picture of me standing still because of all the neat going on. And then we've got the protein thermogenesis. So that's where we start to get into the nutrition part of things. Protein is a very metabolically active food. So that really cranks up the metabolism because it's hard to digest, it's hard to break down. And so you're, you're burning a lot of energy get, getting that protein broken down and digested. And then the same thing happens with slow carbs. By slow carbs, I mean things like broccoli. Green vegetables are the best example of slow carbs because those two have to be broken down and digested and there's a lot of energy in the food, not in the form of calories, but in the form of nutrients. So when you eat that food, the body thinks that it just had it, it just must have had a big huge meal, but it was just a little bit of broccoli because of the nutrient density of that food. And so the body then reacts like it just had a big huge meal. And then there's the, the hit, high intensity exercise, thermogenesis, and excess post exercise oxygen consumption. So that just means your metabolism is still going when you're done. So when you do high intensity exercise, you're burning a lot of energy while you're doing the exercise. And then because it's so intense, you are continuing to burn energy afterwards. And the cool thing about high intensity training is that EPOC is mostly fat burning. So with regular exercise, like uh, running, jogging, things that aren't intense, there's not a big epoch afterwards. You're basically burning calories and energy during the exercise, but then when you're done, it's pretty much over with. With high intensity training, it can go on for intensively for four hours or more after you're done with the exercise. And all it would take would be an 11, 10, 11 minute workout, like Tabata protocols where you're doing interval, high intensity interval training, going to muscle exhaustion, and you can get four or five hours of fat burning, extreme fat burning, after you're done. So your cells are still working out because of all the oxygen needed for recovery from something like that. So the current theory, you've all heard this theory, you've heard burn more calories than you take in to lose weight, and restore your metabolism, or get your metabolism back. And so they say that's the law of thermodynamics. And energy in, energy out. And yeah, it, that applies to things like machines and, and our energy systems, but not to humans, because our metabolism is so dynamic. You also heard that all exercise burns calories. And yeah, that's true. But like I just explained, it's different depending on the type of exercise. So if it's, if it's long duration, Low intensity, you're going to burn calories during exercise. If it's short duration, high intensity, you'll burn during and especially after. And then all calories are the same. So calories a calorie, there's no difference between the calories. And that's just simply not true. So here we got carbohydrates, four calories per gram. Proteins also four calories per gram. And then fat is nine calories per gram. So it's still just calories though. I mean, you, you compare all three and yeah, there might be different calories per gram, but it's just zero calories. So at first glance, it, it looks the same, but it could be believable. 
that all calories are created equal. But then you look down there at fat, and it's more than double per gram the calories of the other two. So you think, well, it must be fat, because calories are fat. But that's not the case either. So calories actually aren't fat, because they're not all created equal. So that two pack of Twinkies is 270 calories. So here's a big, huge thing of spinach. So that's the big tub of spinach you get at Whole Foods. So tell me when you think it's 270 calories. Maybe now? Maybe now? Maybe now? Maybe now? Maybe now? <laughs> that's 270 calories. And those are, those are proportional size, too. So, you know, if you set that, that pack of Twinkies on top of that bin of spinach, I mean, it's all relative. You can see how calorie dense the Twinkies are. And when you eat those Twinkies, there's absolutely no nutrients at all whatsoever, zero. And you can see how much food it takes when you're talking about slow carbs like green vegetables, like spinach, to equal one pack of Twinkies which is super calorie or super nutrient dense. So it's a ton of food. It would be really hard to eat that much spinach. You couldn't do that in a whole day. Oh, well, some people could, but they'd be eating all day and their jaw would be exhausted by the end of the day because that's a ton of spinach. But it's pretty easy to sit down and eat a pack of Twinkies. So calories are definitely not created equal. The Twinkies are what I call a positive fat food. So they're going to bump up the blood sugar, bump up the insulin, put you in a fat storing mood, and because the Twinkies have so much fat in them, you're going to store all that fat. But the spinach is a negative fat food. There's tons of nutrients in there. So even if you eat a little bit, your, your body thinks you ate a lot because of all the nutrients that it's getting. So it goes gangbusters, metabolism goes through the roof, and you end up burning fat just because you ate the spinach. People can actually eat themselves skinny by eating green vegetables and trying to overeat because the more they eat, the skinnier they get. So you see those, those pill commercials, the diet pill commercials on TV and they promise all these things or in the magazines. And everything those pills promise, they don't work by the way, they're just a scam. Spinach fulfills. That's just like what the ad says those diet pills are going to for you. And it's going to make you healthier along the way. So it's it's a combination of calories that also matters. So fast carbs are fattening. So that's like the Twinkie, that's sugars, white bread, white flour, things like that. Fast carbs with fat. So you put the fast carbs like the donut or the cake and you put it with the fat, you're going to absorb that fat. So this is the ultimate example again, Twinkies. Even Mr. Twinkie there is horrified. <laughs> but you combine these fast carbs with that fat, and you're going to store it all, plus some. Because the excess fast carbs are going to eventually turn into fat. The body's going to have to do something with that excess. You can't burn it all off. And it's so fast, and the insulin's cranked up so much, it's got to shove all that stuff in your, in your cells, or else you die of high blood sugar. Not fattening. Well, fat's not fattening. Despite the fact that it's nine calories per gram. Protein's not fattening because it's very thermogenic. Protein with fat is not fattening to an extent. You can eat all the fat in the world and you can't possibly get fat off just eating fat, even if you overeat it and binge on it. But if you overeat and binge on protein, it's possible that you can spike your insulin, and but it's really hard to do. So you have to have an eating disorder in order to eat too much protein and store the fat or convert it to fat. And slow carbs are not fattening. So the green vegetables like the spinach and the broccoli, things like that, can't get fat off that stuff. It just makes you thinner. The more you eat, the thinner you get. And slow carbs with fat. So you see over here, fast carbs with fat is very fat because the fast carbs put your insulin in the, make, elevate your insulin and put you in a fat storing mode. Slow carbs don't elevate your insulin. It just stays nice and low. So you're not in a fat storing mode. You're in a fat burning mode. 
So you, you eat the slow carbs, which put you in a fat burning mode, and you eat fat, which doesn't do anything, doesn't make put you in a fat burning mode either. So then your body says, well, I guess I gotta burn this off. Can't store it. It's not in the mode to store it, can't do it. And then slow carbs with protein also. So broccoli and chicken is not going to put you in a fat storing mode. Even broccoli with a high fat, like bacon, isn't gonna make, isn't gonna have you store fat unless you ate five pounds of bacon. So here's Brian, cereal dieter, many failures, worked out regularly, love Twinkies. And then five months later, and 80 pounds of fat lighter, he stopped dieting, swapped Twinkies for fitness chocolate, which we're gonna have in a little bit here. And he ate more fat and concentrated on eating the higher thermic foods. And he drank more water, which we'll get to, less alcohol, because alcohol does depress the metabolism. And uh, certain hormones like testosterone, which are fat burning hormones. And he changed his exercise style to high intensity training. So the highest thermic foods are, like we already talked about, green vegetables, that's the, that's the king, that's slow carbs. Clean protein, by clean protein I mean organic sources or grass-fed if it's red meat or wild if it's red meat. Otherwise organic's great and if it's foul it should be um, uh, pasture-raised. So they used to say cage-free, chickens or even eggs. They'll say the same thing about chickens and about the eggs. and. Uh, and they still say cage-free, and all cage-free means is that chicken wasn't raised in a cage, which horrifies most people, because that's how most chickens are raised. They never even get out of their cage. They're born in a cage, and they live their life, and then they die in a cage. They never even get to walk around. It's pretty sad. But uh, So the cage-free chickens end up being in a hen house. So they're still crammed in the hen house most of the time, in most of these cases. And it's still not, they're not happy about it, but at least they're not in a cage. So it's better, right? But not much. And then when they say free range chickens, that typically means they're in a, a barn and they open the door. And so the chickens have the option of going outside, but chickens are pretty social and they're not very bright and they like being inside like people do, and so they typically don't use the door, and they just stay in the barn. <laughs> but that can, at least they can say it's free range. But then the pasture-raised chickens and eggs are from, the eggs are from chickens, and the, the meat is from chickens that, they actually kick them out of the barn, and they make them go out in the pasture. So they have to run around and forage, and do that. And that's the best, best way to go. And oh, and then as far as other thing about clean protein would be fish, and that would be wild. And Alaska is the cleanest water that's left. So wild Alaska is the best kind of fish. Then certain fats are very thermic, like MCT stands for medium chain triglycerides. Coconut oil, regular coconut oil, 65% MCTs. Those are super high fat burning fats. And if you get expeller pressed coconut oil, which is the, the one that's liquid at room temperature, even in the fridge, that's 95% MCTs. Or you can just get straight MCTs, like super supplements or some art by that. And you don't want to cook with straight MCTs. You do want to cook with coconut oil, it's great. But straight MCTs is just basically for dressings and ingredients and stuff. Or just taking it, a lot of people just take it by themselves just to make to make their body go into a fat burning mode because the body cannot store MCTs. Not possible. Our physiology can't do it. So it has to burn it off. And so it puts us in, it like primes the fat burning pump and it puts us in fat burning mode. And now we're in, we're burning fat. So the MCT is the thing that primes that. CLA, conjugated linoleic acid, is very common in wild red meat or grass-fed grass cows or grass-fed buffalo. 
a lot of CLA that's also a fat burning fat. Omega-3 is a fat burning fat as well. Not as strong as MCTs, but it's still a negative fat fat. And there's a lot of that in, of course, wild fish. But believe it or not, um, wild red meat too. Grass-fed cows have probably two-thirds the amount that you'll find in a, in a wild salmon of the omega-3s. And then cold water raises the metabolism slightly. So it's, it's just a little thing. But you know, every little thing counts. And another little thing is hot peppers and spices. So those help as well, temporarily, but it helps. The lowest thermic foods are things like sugar, high fructose corn syrup, flour, and other fast carbs. So those are the things that actually lower your metabolism and take the thermic effect down. And then processed foods, so mostly FLS, food-like substances, artificial things, MSG, they did a lot of studies on MSG and they have found that MSG by itself is fattening. So when they give it to whatever animal they picked, that works in all of them. Um, and that's the only thing, the only difference between this group of animals and this group of animals, the MSG animals get that. And MSG doesn't even have any calories, but it's just because of the toxicity of it and the nature of it, it's fat. And so are artificial sweeteners, artificial ingredients, starches, Trans fats are very low thermic because they're basically fake fats. Other fake fats like margarine. Um, margarine was invented to try to fatten up turkeys. It was going to be a cheap way to fatten up turkeys. And so they gave it to the turkeys, but the turkeys refused to eat it because it was just too nasty and they're too smart. Turkeys aren't very smart, but they're too smart to eat margarine. So they said, well, you know, we, we invented this great thing, so what are we going to do with it? We decided to start feeding it to humans. <laughs> and non-organic fats. So non-organic fats can be highly toxic, especially from conventional cattle, conventionally raised, even fowl, um, or farm fish. And when they have those toxins in them, they go into our body and we store them. Toxins are, are most readily stored in our fat cells. And that's the same for humans and animals. So when an animal is raised on a conventional farm with a lot of pesticides and hormones and antibiotics and all that stuff that they're feeding in along with the food, then that animal is becoming toxic and it's eating its, all those toxins. And so its physiology says, well, we're eating all this, all this poison so what are we going to do with this? Well, our safest storage facility is our fat cells. So let's put it there. And then it goes to the store, we buy it, we eat it, and then we're eating that those toxins in the fat of that. And then, and then the same thing, the cycle happens all over. It comes into our body, our body says the same thing, it's in our fat cells, and then it's really hard to burn off the fat on our bodies because it's toxic and the body doesn't want to re-release those toxins. So it makes it harder when we're eating these non-clean foods. So this is sugar in America. So you can see here that uh, in 1822, the average American consumed 45 grams of sugar every five days. And then you can see the sugar chart since the 1820s up until now has just exploded. And now we're consuming almost 800 grams of sugar every five days. And this is a fast carb, and this is a low thermic food. So no wonder obesity is becoming an epidemic. So high intensity exercise is very thermic. It raises the metabolism, especially things like muscle failure strength training. Go into complete muscle fatigue. And when you go to complete muscle fatigue, the body says, wow, what just happened? And when it says that, it reacts to it, and in a way it overreacts. And now the cells are doing cardio after you're done for four or five hours. 
So it's the reaction to the high intensity training. And with this muscle failure training, the body can't adapt to it either. But it can with sub-fatigue training. And the way it adapts to it is it says, okay, I've done this before, I'm used to this, I'm gonna get really efficient at this. And then as it becomes more efficient at that activity, that's called adaptation. And then you're not getting the same benefit out of it. But when you're doing muscle failure training, it can't get efficient at that because you're going to the wall every time, pushing it to complete failure, to complete fatigue, and it can't adapt to that. So this is too intense. Interval cardio training is basically just high intensity interval training. So TabataProtocol.com is the best example of that. If you go to that website, you'll see a workout on there that takes 11 minutes. So it's really short, but it's equivalent to about an hour or more of low intensity, like going for a run. And same thing, because it's going to your limit on every interval, the body can't adapt to it. So the short, intense, maximum effort exercise produces bodies like this. So they're toned, they're muscular, these are sprinters, jumpers, things like that. And it trains your cortisol system, which is very important because most people's cortisol system is completely screwed up because they're in fight or flight all day long. And when you're in fight or flight all day long, it wears out, the cortisol system wears out, and cortisol is your dominant hormone in your body, which is a fat storing hormone. So the reason that people are in fight or flight all day is because they're stressed out all day. They're watching the news, they're stressed out at work, they don't have stress reduction techniques, and so when they're that way all the time, their cortisol is elevated all the time, and that's a problem. The cortisol system is meant to be only for fight or flight. So 10,000 years ago, the cortisol system came in really handy when we're running away from a tiger. And then 20 seconds later, we're either eaten and dead or we got away. And if we got away, we can relax because the tiger gave up and it's on its right way. And then it's over. So cortisol is great because it, it shunts the blood to the muscles that you know, need to get out of there and, it, and it, puts, it shunts the blood to the part of the brain that helps us be really smart about you know, figuring a way out of the situation. And then it's, but it's supposed to be over with because if the cortisol keeps going and stays elevated, then it has negative effects on the body. The main one being fat burning, especially, or fat storing, especially around the middle because there's more receptor sites for cortisol around the around our gut and, and, and visceral fat around our organs than other areas. So stress can certainly be fattening if it's too long, too much, and we don't get that we don't get that relief. But when you're doing the short intense efforts like sprinting, jumping, and high intensity training, it's over with fast. As opposed to the long duration like the marathon. So you can see the difference in physi in the physiques here. So you got the marathoners that are doing three, four hours of, of running every day, extended cortisol uh, release, and you can see the effect on their body. I mean, part of it, of course, is their cells are shrinking down to be more efficient, but the other part is the whole cortisol thing, and it's breaking them down. But the reason that they don't have, a, they're not fat around their middle is because they're running for four hours a day. <laughs> So they're burning off a lot, but it's still a detriment towards their muscle and towards their metabolism, and it's lower thermic. So the high intensity stuff is much higher thermic. So these sprinters and these jumpers are having extremely, enjoying extremely low body fat percentages with short burst exercise, while the long duration people have to work out for hours a day and probably not even get as low and as far as body fat percentages go. So sleep is key to burning fat because your body burns most of its fat while you're asleep. Testosterone and growth hormone spike, those are both fat burning hormones. Those spike the most while you're at sleep. 
and then you're rebuilding and repairing organs that contribute to your metabolism, especially your liver. So when you're repairing those metabolism organs, you're able to uh, recover and have a higher metabolism overall from day to day. And then pancreas is important because a healthy pancreas is never going to overreact on insulin secretion. And the other cells are going to hear the insulin that's secreted from the pancreas. And so that whole cycle makes is a, is a tighter feedback loop. And with that tight feedback loop, you're able to shut off the hunger mechanism sooner. And you're able to keep more even spikes so it's level blood sugar instead of spiking up and down all day. And to push off that diabetes monster. So cleaning up, detoxing is really important. So reducing chemicals, we talked about how important that is because they get stored in the fat cells. And other things like uh, BPAs, so we're trying to reduce those as well. You'll find BPAs in a lot of plastics, even receipts from the store. Pizza boxes are coated, and even inside of um, some canned foods, the lining in the food cans can be have a lot of BPA in there. No GMO, you're staying away from genetically modified foods. Because GMO foods will depress the metabolism, and because they're also toxins, though the toxins from that get stored in your cells. Because the body doesn't really know what a GMO food is. It, it, it looks like, you know, it walks like food and talks like food, but it's basically a food-like substance because the body's pretty smart. So it, it gets this genetically modified food in there and says, okay, we don't really know what to do with this. We do see some toxic stuff in here, like Roundup, um, which is a weed killer that ends up in the food. And so it says, well, let's just let's put it in the fat cells until we can figure out what to do with it. And then drinking lots of filtered water. I recommend a zero water filter to people. Get a Bed Bath & Beyond, some 40 bucks. And um, that's a great filter because it gets out a lot of the, most of the stuff in our tap water, including, I think, fluoride. They're not officially rated that way, but it's just because they haven't been an independent lab tested for that. <clears throat> but um, it's better than the other, I think, the Brita and the Pure filters, in my opinion. And then detoxing is helpful, hydration. Um, so water is key for detoxing. And green vegetables are great for detoxing because when you're having that high density nutrition pushing into the cells, you're pushing out the junk because the cells want that stuff. They're gonna soak it in and then to make room for it, they're gonna push out the bad stuff. Clean fiber is also great because when you're eating fiber, fiber binds to, to fat in a lot of cases and other stuff and then just pulls it right out. So that's a great way to detox high fiber foods. High intensity exercise, two to five times a week. Um, some people, two is enough. Some of the extreme clients, that's all they do, just twice a week. And that's great. It's all I have time for. It's all I have desire for. Other people do more. That's great too. And then down at the bottom, what does that say? Oh, that's the uh, colon hydrotherapy. So for people that want to get on the fast track. And then the hydration is so important because it makes you it makes sure that your liver is healthy. Your liver is going to be stressed dehydrated because when you're dehydrated your kidneys aren't working right and when your kidneys aren't working right your liver has to help out your kidneys so if your liver's busy helping out your kidneys it can't do its other jobs and some of those jobs are metabolic functions in fact the liver has over a hundred metabolic functions so if you want a high metabolism that also means a healthy liver and hydration frees it up to be healthy. So doesn't have to help out the kidneys. So there's a hormone called ghrelin that we talked about in the last talk. And ghrelin overreacts. So when your stomach is empty, ghrelin tells the brain, hey, go get some food. And however, you may not actually be hungry. You may just be thirsty. Because most people are dehydrated. And when they're dehydrated, 
they have forced their body to learn how to extract water from the food they eat. So when their body gets thirsty, it says, hey, I'm hungry. Go get me some food so I can extract the water out of it. Because that's what it's learned to do. So the ghrelin is screaming for food, not because you're really hungry, it's just because you're thirsty. And then when you start drinking water, get in proper hydration habits, your hunger me mechanism starts working right. And so does your thirst mechanism. Now instead of being hungry all the time and never thirsty, which is what most dehydrated people are, when you start becoming hydrated, you're thirsty all the time. And then you're hungry a lot less. Hydration also helps the brain hear leptin. So leptin comes from the fat cells and it tells the body, or it tells the brain, stop eating. So it's the opposite of ghrelin. And the water, the hydration, helps the brain hear that signal. It also helps the cells hear insulin. Because so many people eat so much sugar and fast carbs that their pancreas is pumping out insulin all day to try to get that blood sugar down. And pretty soon, the cells just stop listening because they're just tired of hearing the pancreas shout out. Well, water helps the cells hear that. It clears up their ears and it helps them hear insulin so they don't overreact as much as they would if they didn't hear it and the pancreas had to keep shouting and putting out more insulin. And it makes the pancreas work better. So it's a lot more efficient. It doesn't overreact as much because it's hydrated. Our bodies are 65% water. Muscles and, and organs are even higher percentage than that. So it makes sense if the pancreas is over 70% water, then it, if it doesn't have its main ingredient, it's probably not gonna be working right. And then gut bacteria is key to thermogenesis because there's a lot of cells in there. We actually have more cells in our gut, more bacteria cells in our gut, than us cells. Trillions and trillions and trillions. And those cells are very active. They're doing lots of stuff. And they're burning a lot of energy. Skinny people have a higher quantity of gut bacteria and a higher variety, bigger variety of gut bacteria. Gut bacteria also make happy chemicals like serotonin. More serotonin is produced in the gut than the brain. Gut bacteria is your immune system. So it helps your metabolism, it also helps you stay well. And it's our second brain, and it communicates with ghrelin and leptin and the other major neurotransmitters to tell us an accurate feedback loop of hunger. And so how to get gut bacteria healthy? Well, it's eating the foods that we already talked about. So the high nutrient density foods. And that creates a higher number of good gut bacteria, the kind that raises our metabolism and does all this stuff. When you're eating junk foods and chemicals, processed foods, that encourages growth of the bad bacteria that completely goes against the metabolism and takes our our metabolism down, tanks it down. And the gut bacteria also helps fight inflammation. When somebody is chronically inflamed, they have a hard time losing weight. When they cut down on that inflammation and fight that inflammation and find ways to break that inflammation, weight loss is much easier. And this is one way to do it. And the gut bacteria is also responsible for proper nutrient absorption. So you're gonna absorb the nutrients that you eat instead of just passing through and be hungry for more. And one of the last things I want to talk about is epigenetics because it's a new science that just came out. We used to think that the genes that we were born with are the genes that we're stuck with. So if we're born with a whole bunch of fat genes, we're just going to be fat and there's nothing we can do about it. A lot of people still believe that. And, or if somebody's born skinny genes, then they're just always going to be skinny and they can eat whatever they want. But we're actually born with both. Some people are born with more skinny genes than fat genes, but we all have both. And how we move and what we eat determines which genes get expressed. So 
maybe I was born with a majority of fat genes and a minority of skinny genes. But because of what I've done with my lifestyle, my skinny genes are the ones that are expressed and the fat genes are dormant. And this expression can even be passed down to future generations. So they can, they can inherit the expression of the skinny genes over the fat genes, which is pretty cool. And that's new science that we didn't think was possible before. So now we get to have some chocolate. And any vegans in the room? No? Okay. So there's two varieties here. And these are the ingredients. Uh, anybody allergic to anything up here? So we know we're safe with that. As you can tell, they're all real food ingredients instead of processed food. And this is why it is a fat-burning recipe. And this recipe is on the Extreme website. So you could, anybody can make this at home. A ton of people are already making this that I know. So it's, it's almost three grams of fat per piece, average piece. And it's fat-burning fat because fat, it's coconut oil. So it's a negative fat fat. This is actually a weight loss food. And the carbs are also very slow carbs which are coming from things like cacao, which is a superfood, it's a seed. They call it a bean, but it's really a seed. And it's raw, and then fiber, tons of fiber in there, especially with the, the, the pieces that have chia seeds. And then there's a ton of protein in there, because there's whey protein powder mixed into that, which is completely unique for chocolate. And so it's metabolism boosting, so it's a thermogenic food as well. And this is my contact info, book, video, that kind of stuff. So we'll pass this out here while that's up on the screen. I eat a whole batch of that every day. So when you go on the XGM website and see the recipe, um, that's a lot of chocolate. One batch is almost 2,000 calories. And I'm eating that every day. <laughs> so I eat probably 3,500 calories a day. But 2,000 of those calories is chocolate. So it started out as an experiment. You know, because I, I wanted, I knew on paper, I knew it was going to be thermogenic. But I didn't believe it because it tasted too good. And it tasted too much like chocolate. I mean, all the foods that I eat taste awesome. And most of the recipes are on the Extreme website. Uh, so all my food tastes great. It certainly doesn't taste like diet food. Um, but this tasted too good to be true, I thought. And most things that seem too good to be true are. So I just said, well, I'll just binge on it. And I'll just do it for a whole month. And I didn't gain any body fat. In fact, I lost a little bit. And so I just said, well, okay, I'll keep doing the experiment. and then. Now it's a year later and I still haven't stopped. It's not really an experiment now, it's more of a lifestyle. <laughs> so then the next talk is the brain training. This is actually, I think, the most interesting talk because no one's talking about brain training. It's not even on the radar with other trainers. But this is key. And the reason that it's key is because it helps you rewire your brain to get rid of the habits you want to get rid of and then makes it easier to create the habits you want to create and then to make those habits permanent. So this is the way to do that because the brain can learn how to do that. So any questions? Good question. As far as body fat percentage goes, uh -huh. um, obviously just based on the pictures, the, the sprinters have a more attractive body type and they look healthier. How would you would interpret, how most people would interpret health just based on their muscle tissue. Yeah. But at what point does the threshold kind of inverse as far as uh, health benefit go if you get too low uh, of body fat yeah. percentage? And I don't ask that for myself because I don't think any of us are going to become 
get to that five percent wide receiver <laughs> body fat level, but that is it true? Would five percent be healthier than eight or ten percent, or is there a certain point that would be the healthiest for the average? Mm -hmm. For some people, that is healthy, but that's rare. For athletes that are just working out all the time, moving all the time, they're eating a ton of food, they're fine, they're perfectly healthy at 5%. Um, but for your normal person, everyday Joe Schmo, probably not, although I've, I've certainly seen it. I mean, my roommate through college, a couple of the years, um, he was 4%, just all the time just walking around, just because that's who he was. He was perfectly healthy, ate a ton of food, but um, he was also very thermogenic and you know, did a lot of these things that we talked about today. But that's also kind of his natural set point, just the way he was. Um, one of my other roommates, his natural set point was about 18% body fat. So, you know, with shirt off, you know, kind of soft, not fat, not even chubby, but he looked completely different from this other guy. But their physiologies were very unique and they were actually both really healthy. So what I tell people is just get healthy first and then see where you land. It's going to be somewhere between this guy and this guy. So those guys were both on the edges of the bell curve and everyone else is going to be somewhere in there. So I wouldn't think, I've never seen a, a healthy guy in my experience, that's more than 18%. And I've never seen a healthy guy that's less than 4% without really trying either on either way. But I have seen that range. Most guys are have their optimum health at around, you know, 11, 12, 13%. But women are completely different. Because where this guy at 18%, that's the top end of the, the bell curve that's kind of the bottom end of the bell curve for women. So when they get below that point is when they can start to be unhealthy. And then they go up to the mid 20% and would stay perfectly healthy. Even the high 20s can be healthy for a woman. Uh, but they can tell when they're not healthy because they get amenorrheic. And some women, um, just really want to get leaner and they but 20% they get down to 20% and now boom all of a sudden now they're not regular anymore so then if they still if they really want to get leaner then what they should do is go up a little bit to like 22 stay there for a while a couple months or more and then try then see if 20% is doable a lot of times it is but still you know, even though they push it and push it and push it like this, when they get into the high teens, that's usually the, the bottom of the bell curve, the left side of the bell curve. So um, you don't see very many healthy women that are leaner than that. There are certainly anomalies. Um, and I, I ha I've known women that are 12, 13 um, percent, and they're perfectly healthy, but it's super rare. That answer the question. Yeah. Yeah. What is the method for testing body fat percentage? Well, there's lots of methods for testing body fat, and the most common method is skin full calipers. So that's the pinch test. I remember doing that in like, middle school. It was fun. Yeah. <laughs> you go into the bathroom and like a partner and do the pinch <laughs> test. Like, yeah. That's the only way that I know. Yeah. yeah. And it's not. It's really not a bad test. It's actually pretty accurate for 80% of the people. For 20% of the people, it's not going to be very accurate because it's, it's estimating your body fat percentage based on a formula. So you get your, your skin fold measurements and then you plug it into a formula. And then the formula is guessing what you are on the inside. So it's, 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 really, it's just a guess. And this, this guess is pretty good for most people, but like I say, about 80%. Then the other 20% formula is not very good for that, just because they're just different, everybody's different. There's also the impedance 
the bioelectrical impedance method. So you've seen the Tanita scales where you stand on it and you know it's got the electrodes. And that's actually a better measure of hydration than body fat. Because you'll notice if you're dehydrated, it'll say you're you, all of a sudden you gain 10 pounds of fat. If you're super hydrated, now all of a sudden you're super lean. So the problem with the Tanita is it goes from one foot to the other foot and because electricity has to follow its shortest path it just goes from your foot up through your crotch and down to your other foot so from here up it's not testing anything and so there's a formula in the thing that guesstimates what you are from here up and you can see how different everybody is from here up I mean some people have this cortisol thing going on where they got this huge spare tire in here and these skinny little bird legs and of course, what's going to happen? Well, it's going to miss all that stuff. It's going to, just going to test their skinny little bird legs. So there, there are better impedance machines, like we have one at the X-Gym where you have two electrodes on the hand and the foot. So then it goes this way. The only thing that's missing is your head. So unless you're a fat head, then it's going to be pretty close. Um, because we're never fatter from the right side. We don't have a fat right side and a skinny left side. We do have a fat upper and a skinny lower sometimes, or a fat lower and a skinny upper. But So it's a lot better to do the hand to foot. And then we also have a machine that you actually stand on and grab a hold of. And there's eight electrodes on that sucker, and it's got both hands and both feet. And that's super accurate. So we really like that one. And that's, that's accurate for probably nine out of ten people, just right on to scientific levels. Yes, underwater weighing, hydrostatic weighing. So that's pretty good. Um, the only formula in that one really is testing or, or guessing on your lung volume. But there's scientific models of that as well. And those models will measure your lung volume the title at least, there's going to be some residual that they're still guessing on, but the formula is more accurate when they're measuring. But most most people that get tested for the hydrostatic are not getting tested for their lungs. It's just because that's pretty high, high maintenance. So they just climb in the tank and it weighs them. And it's good. Uh, it's better than skin folds. And it's better than the electrode on one side of the body, but it's not as good as the machine we have that does both hands and both feet. And then there's the bod pod, which is a hyperbaric um, chamber. It's doing the same thing, but you just don't have to get wet because you just get in an air, airtight chamber, and it measures displacement that way. And then there's also the uh, impedance machines where you just hold them in your hand. But it's the same problem. It just goes through your arms and back to the other arm. It's guessing on everything else. And then there's another scale out there that has the hand and the feet. So you grab the handles, and you hold it out like this, and then it's supposed to be testing all four, like we have at the, at the X Gym. But I haven't found that it's any better than just, just the two feet or the two hands. So it's all over the place, again, with hydration. Part of the reason is it's just one frequency. And that frequency is kind of a mid range frequency. So it's kind of like having a mid range speaker. You only hear that part. But when you go outside that range, you're testing a lot more cells and the accuracy increases and you're not just testing hydration, you're also testing muscle tissue, fat tissue, all those tissues. Because electricity just passes at different speeds to different tissues, but if you're only getting certain tissues, it's not going to be very accurate. So the machine we have has three different frequencies, including one that's super high frequency that actually penetrates the cell membrane. So that's another reason it's, it's so much more accurate. About slow carbs and fast carbs. Like yeah. Okay, good question. So, fruit, as far as slow carbs and fast carbs goes, is kind of a middle of the road carb. So, uh, too much fruit can be a problem. And because that can potentially spike insulin, or a high sugar fruit like bananas can potentially spike insulin. So, it can act like a fast carb. Most fruit won't. And, but it gets you another way. So even though it won't spike, and the reason it won't, most fruit doesn't spike your insulin is because fruit, fructose, the fruit sugar, bypasses your, your digestive system. And 
for anything to spike insulin, it has to happen through the digestive system. So since it's bypassing that, it doesn't show up. It, it doesn't show up on the pancreas radar. However, it goes straight to the liver, and the liver turns at least half of it into triglycerides, which is fat. So that's how fruit is fat. Half of it or more is being turned into fat by the liver. Same thing with alcohol. Alcohol is not going to spike your insulin, per se, unless it's a high sugar alcohol, and the sugar is going to do it. But it's going to bypass that digestive system, go straight to the liver. The liver is going to do the same thing with it that it does with fructose. Half of it or more is going to turn into triglycerides. Thank you.